morning, Kingwood Church Online. Good to have you here. Are you glad to be here? Yeah. Yes. I'm glad to see you, and I'm glad to have those of you sharing with us online today. I want to remind you, if you haven't done it yet, to check out the top three things happening at Kingwood Church. The way you do that is scan the QR code on the screen. If you're online, it's there on the screen or on the chair in front of you. And that'll take you to the top three things happening at Kingwood. Let me highlight one of those. If you haven't heard of the One for One Club yet, it's an uh, on-ramp, discipleship on-ramp. We started just late last year, and this is the second time we've talked about it, so you may not have heard of it yet. But if you're here in person, you have a card in the uh, chair beside you, or if you're online, or if you want to access it digitally, Again, top three QR code. It's the first one there on the top three. You can scan it that way. So uh, scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians 8, 7, but since you excel in everything in faith and speech and knowledge in complete earnestness and in the love we've kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. So the scripture teaches us that part of our faith journey is to excel in generosity and in giving. But that's a step of faith for most of us that we acquire somewhere throughout that process. Did you know that the average American spends 92% of everything they make, invests 6%, and only gives 2% to anything? How many of you know God's got better math? <laughs> God's got better math than that. And he describes it to us there. So here's what the One for One Club is. You can look on the back of the card if you have it, or you can see on, on the screen or online. You can see the progression that you can take as a giver to grow in and excel in this grace of giving at Kingwood Church. Now here's what I want to invite you to do. If, you're, if you've never been a, a regular or faithful giver, I want to invite you to join the One for One Club because here's what it means. It means that you will commit to give at least 1% of your income for a year, and here's what that does. That sets in motion a communication between me and you. I'll send you an email once a month filled with resources, and here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about uh, debt, we're gonna talk about budgeting, we're gonna talk about uh, uh, invest, not, not, in, not investing, sorry, I'm not giving you investing advice. Let me back up on that one. Uh, we will talk about uh, giving, We'll talk about savings. We'll talk about all kinds of things because God has better math, and this is a resource that we've created for you to help you grow in financial health, all right? So all you have to do is say, look, I want to take a step of faith, and I want to be part of God's math. How do I get in? Sign the card. You can drop it off on your way out. You can fill it out online, and you'll get, a, you'll get an email from us really soon saying, welcome, and then every month for a year, we're going to send you a resource that's going to help you take steps of faith in God's math in all kind of areas, all right? So maybe you say, look, if you really wanted to help people grow in this area, just send everybody the email. And here's why we're not going to do that. Because Jesus said it best. He said, where your treasure is, your heart will be also, right? And so if you haven't invested anything into something, Jesus said your heart's not in it. And here's what I know. How many of you have emails you don't open? Yes? How many of you spam them? How does how your spam uh, account look? Full, right? And so if your heart's not in the journey, not only are you not going to apply any of the things we're teaching you, you're not going to open the email and read it. But if your heart's in the journey, now we can teach you and give you an on-ramp to discipleship and to grow in generosity as we're trying to invest and help you grow in a lot of other areas. So I want to encourage you, take the journey. It's the beginning of the new year. It's a great time to take a step of faith and watch God work in all areas of your life, not just in some of the areas of your life. So um, today, we are continuing our series we've called Re-Up. So at the beginning of the year, we, you know, sign up, re-up on our gym membership, re-up on our insurance. There's a lot of things people want us to re-sign up for that we're kind of already signed up for, but they want us to make a new commitment. So we've been asking the question, what are the things that we as a community of faith might be called by God to recommit ourselves to in this year? So I, I want to uh, set it up by telling you this story. When our youngest son was six years old, we went to Disney World, 
And it's the first time he had ever been to Disney World, and he was six years old, and we got to the uh, Star Wars section. Now, for those of you who aren't sci-fi people, I'm so sorry that you've missed this incredible franchise we've called Star Wars. I'm sorry that you've missed it, and I'm going to speak some Star Wars language that you won't fully understand. But um, we went over to the Star Wars area, and there was this guy on stage. You know, I don't know if he was Obi-Wan Kenobi, who he was supposed to be, but he's going to teach all the, all the kids that, are inter- that want to learn to be a Padawan. Now, you might not know what a Padawan is. A Padawan's a Jedi in training. I mean, if you know what a Padawan is. Yeah, it's a Jedi in training. So all you had to do is volunteer, and then he would pick a few kids. And our kid got picked, our six-year-old. He got chosen. He goes on stage. They put the little Padawan robe on him, and they give him a lightsaber. How many of you know any day with a lightsaber is a good day, right? He's got a lightsaber, and they're teaching him, you know, move like this and move like this. And then you hear this wah, wah, you hear this noise, you know, and go like that. And I mean, they are like on top of the world. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this ominous music begins to play. And a door from behind all the kids open, and all you can see in it is deep darkness. And smoke starts to billow out of this little cave. And you start to hear this muffled breathing. <sighs> You know what that is, right? And the lights begin to appear as you can see them on his chest. And this bomb, bomb, ba bomb, and Darth Vader steps out of this little cave. And you should see the kids shrink back. They're like, oh no. You know, I don't want to be a Padawan. Just kidding. You know, take the take all the stuff. And and uh, and what they did is they trained them how to be a you know a Jedi. And so they brought uh, Tyler, our little six-year-old, up, and they said, okay. Now, you got to fight Darth Vader. And I've got this picture I want to show you of him fighting Darth Vader. You can see him w- w- wielding the wand. Can you, can you bring that up? Yes? No? We got it? We don't? There it is. You can see him. There he is. It's six years old. Now, don't tell him he's off in college. Don't tell him I showed his picture today. Don't anybody tell him. <laughs> but there he is. And I wish you could zero in, like zoom in on his face. You can see he is filled with this amazing, overwhelming awe. Like, I mean, he's like the lightsaber shaking. He's like, it's Darth Vader. You know, I don't want to fight. So he had to fight Darth Vader. That was a moment in a six-year-old's mind of absolute, complete, overwhelming awe. Now today, I want to talk to you about the awe of God. I want to talk to you about what the awe of God is. Now, let me just give you a little background on how we got to this series. We've been looking at the dedication of the temple in the Old Testament that King Solomon was dedicating. They had a gigantic celebration. It was the peak of Israel's history, and for, uh, there were 15 generations from Abraham, who's the father of many nations, to King Solomon, and 15 generations had gone by, and this promise of a temple being rebuilt in Jerusalem was uh, given to David. It's a generational promise. And now Israel's at its absolute apex. And they had this celebration to dedicate this incredible temple. It was like a wonder of the world. It took 14 days. They celebrated for 14 days and prayed and dedicated and all of that. Now, unfortunately, the 14 generations after Solomon, Israel went into spiritual decline. And the reason they went into Spiritual decline is because they didn't take seriously the things that they had prayed and celebrated and dedicated themselves to during the dedication of the temple. So we've been looking at the dedication of the Old Testament temple and been asking the question, in changing times and in the beginning of the new year, what parallel might there be from the Old Testament temple to the New Testament temple, and what might we dedicate ourselves to in this season? And how can we learn from the lesson of Israel and not do what they did and not go into 14 generations of spiritual decline? Because you know in the New Testament, the temple's not a building. It's not this building. It's not this room. The temple is is every person who has Jesus living in their heart. The New Testament says you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you're a believer, the Holy Spirit lives inside you. And not just that. We as the church, I don't mean the building, I don't mean the property, I don't mean the campus, I mean the people. You can take this group of people and gather them anywhere on earth, and you know what you'll be? The temple of God. Because the Holy Spirit lives in the heart of individuals, individual believers, and in the heart of the church. So we said last week, one of the things that we ought to recommit ourselves to, to re-up on, is the Word of God. 
Now today, I'm going to talk to you about the awe of God. But what I want to read for you is the very beginning of King Solomon's prayer when he was dedicating the temple and show you, show you where we're going to get that from. Verse 22, chapter 8, verse 22. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly of Israel, spread out his hands toward heaven and said, Lord, the God of Israel, there is no one like you in heaven. There is, that's the phrase I want to burn in your heart today. There is no one like you in heaven above or on earth below. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way. Now we're going to jump to verse 27. This is the end of it. But will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple that I've built? What's Solomon saying? Even this, though this temple is the greatest structure in Israel and it's the greatest edifice that we've ever seen, it can't contain the Spirit of God. It's an inadequate temple because, God, there's no one like you. So he spread out his hands and he said, there's no one like you. What is that? That's the awe of God. Solomon, King Solomon was stating and was experiencing and knew in that moment that God was awesome and God was powerful. And so what is all? All is when you have a perspective or an experience that you realize that there's something much bigger than you thought it was, much bigger than you, and it makes you feel small. It's like our son who thought he was a big dude when he had his lightsaber, but then when Darth Vader came out, he felt very small. That's what awe is. Awe is understanding that God is transcendent. It's like when you go to the Grand Canyon and you get near the edge and you go, wow. Or you look in the night sky and you think, I wonder what all kinds of things the James Webb Telescope is going to find out there. It's amazing. Or it's when you have some historical event that, that shakes you, like the COVID pandemic that spread all over the whole world, and all of a sudden we realize we're much smaller than we thought we were because we've encountered something much bigger than us. All is a, is a fear and a wonder of something we can't completely understand. Psychologists have universally agreed there's about 10 human emotions that we experience as humans. Here, here's what they are. Love, remorse, fear, anger, sadness, trust, surprise, anticipation, joy, and disgust. Those are 10 kind of universal emotions. In 2007, Dr. Paul Parasol wrote a book called Awe, and he argues in his book that there's actually an 11th emotion. And here's what he says about it. My study of awe indicates that its defining characteristic is what psychologists call ego death, meaning dissolution of the sense of self replaced by a feeling of total immersion in and in connection with something much more vast and meaningful. All's ability to briefly kill our ego or block our brain's egotism, watch this line, is one of the most powerful means for enhancing our mental, physical, and spiritual well-being. You want to have, have a good year? Get caught up in the awe of God. And that will do more for you than you can imagine. When we realize something is bigger than us and we have this revelation of God that he's transcended and we realize God is bigger. There's no one like you. That's what Solomon said. God, there's no one like you. If you want to have a good year, if you want to grow, if you want your life to change, man, walk in the awe of God. Because here's the thing. God is in a category all by himself. He has no equal. He has no rival. He has no opposite. There's nobody like him. We assign human characteristics to him because we try to wrap our human brain around him to understand him, but it's inadequate. It'll never fully describe who he is because he is altogether different. Now, I want to do something I don't often do in a sermon, but I want to read for you six verses from the chapter of Isaiah 40, if you want to experience the awe of God, if you want to read about the awe of God, I encourage you, read the whole chapter. 
But I've pulled a few verses from it this morning because I want to, I want to read to you how Isaiah explained the awe of God. Here it is in verse 12, verse, chapter 40. Isaiah says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord? Or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They're regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Verse 25. To whom will you compare me, God says? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? Who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls forth each one of them by name? Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. There is no one like you. There's no one like you. What does it look like to live in the awe of God? What would your life be like if you were experiencing the awe of God? Well, I've done my best to scratch out what I think it looks like, and I want to give it to you. When you live in the awe of God, when you walk in the awe of God, when you're experiencing moments of the awe of God, the greatest joy in your life is your relationship with Jesus. There's no There's nothing that compares. There's nothing that you would trade it for. Your spiritual dreams have become greater than your earthly dreams. Cynicism has been replaced by curiosity and wonder. Anxiety is replaced by peace. And your need for control is replaced by surrender to God. You're not easily disappointed or angered. Complaining has been replaced by gratitude. You focus more on what you've been given than what you hope to get. You deeply believe in, the, in God's goodness. And you define, you define circumstances by what God says. You don't try to define God by your circumstances. And you do everything you can to share the faith that you have because you want everybody else to experience the joy that you know. That's what it looks like to live in awe. We were created to live in the awe of God. The problem is tomorrow's Monday. Right? You go, that sounds great at church. But like tonight, you know, when we run out of dog food and it's minus 40 or whatever it's going to be. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the sleet's coming and the water pipes are freezing and my car breaks down and I walk out tomorrow and my cars are flat, tires are flat because the cold temperature deflates. You know what I'm saying? Life takes over. It all sounds good. The truth is, all is a battle. All is a battle. You know why it's a battle? Because the world is filled with so many things that sparkle. The world is filled with so many things that grab our attention. And they're screaming at us, take your shot. It's your turn. Double your money. Sign up for the experience of a lifetime. Have an adventure. You only live once. Live it. Live for yourself. Nobody else is going to do it. Build more followers. Climb the ladder. Have it your way. I think we confuse sometimes adrenaline for the awe of God. We so badly want to experience, we want to feel something that we go ride the new roller coaster or get the new thing or the new technology or the new experience, the new whatever, and we feel something. We go, whoa, wasn't that fun? Man, that's what life's all about. That's not what life's all about. What life's all about is not adrenaline. It's about the awe of God. I think we sometimes confuse dopamine for the awe of God. 
We say, how many likes did I get? How many likes did I get? Who liked that? Who commented? What did they say? How many people talked about it? Bro, doesn't that make me feel good? I'm so important. Look how many likes I get. And we get little dopamine shots as we interact with technology and look for affirmation because we want to feel something. Because we live in this, in this ever-increasing numbness and anxiety and, and flatness. And we say, I just want to feel. And every time we get a shot of one of those chemicals, we go, whoo, wasn't that good? But it's a substitute. It's an imposture for the, for the awe of God. So many things are screaming for our attention and they overpromise and underdeliver and they blind us to the stunning glory of God's awe, of the wonder. There's no one like you. Do you feel that? Do you experience that? Do you believe that? Do you see that in your life? There's no one like you. There's no one like you. King Solomon stretched his arms out and he said, even this stupid little temple that we built, it can't contain you. There's nobody like you, God. And we forget when we substitute his infinite greatness and we embrace a life of spiritual anorexia and we eat very little of God's glorious food and we feed ourselves off the crumbs of temporary things and we're constantly hungry, constantly unsatisfied. Our spiritual muscles shrink and we lose all sense of wonder. Because we don't experience the awe of God. C.S. Lewis said it this way. If I can find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. You weren't made for this. I wasn't made for this. You know why living here is hard? Because we weren't made for it. We weren't built to live in a world ruled by sin. We weren't built to live in a world ruled by dysfunction and brokenness. So it leaves us dissatisfied and frustrated and empty with no peace. We have to draw from another world. We have to draw from the world we were created from and to try to pull it. How do you live in this world? You live in the awe of God. You've got to stoke the awe of God in your life. How do you do that? All right. I'm going, to give you, I'm going to give you a few ways. How do you live in the awe of God? Number one, just repent. Let's start where we start. What do you mean repent? I mean, I mean just go to God and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I tried to do it on my own. And I'm sorry that I've tried to Fill my life with things that I thought would make it meaningful, but they're poor substitutes for you. And I'm sorry that I've invested so much in so many things. I'm sorry that I've chased so many things. And I'm sorry that I have neglected and ignored you at times as I have. And God, I'm sorry. And I just ask you to forgive me. And I ask you to grab my attention again. And let me know the awe of God. Let me see it. Let me experience it. Let me understand it. That you, you are bigger. There's no one like you. So just tell God. Just talk to God for letting other things in your life become bigger than him, more important than him, things you're more excited about than him. You draw more joy. You've invested deeper. And Can I tell you something? 21 days, what we're doing right now at our church of prayer and fasting is an incredible time just to repent. It's a great time just to set it down before him and say, God, I don't want this year to be like any of the other ones. I don't want this year to be like last month. I don't want this year to be like last week. God, I repent. (laughs) And I confess. And it's not them, and it's not those people over there, and it's not politics, and it's not the church. It's It's me. Like right here. You don't have to look anywhere else. It's right here. God, I want to know you're all. And I repent. Number two, replace the replacements. <laughs> what, what captures your attention the most? What in your life competes for the attention that only God should get? Is it, is it work? 
Is it your personal goals? Is it dreams? Is it hobbies? Is it your family? See, whatever you've anchored your joy and satisfaction and imagination into more than God, you have replaced God with that. Now, what I'm suggesting that you do is you switch it and you replace that with God because that's a replacement. That's a filler. That's a, uh, it's, a, it's a fake thing. It's a, it'll never deliver. If you, if you uh, anchor your satisfaction and joy in anything other than God, it'll go up and down and your joy and satisfaction will go up and down with it. But if you anchor your joy and satisfaction in God, it can remain because God doesn't go up and down. He doesn't have a bad day. <laughs> he doesn't have an off day. And he never changes, changes his mind. He doesn't have an evil thought about you. He's never going to slip. He's never going to fall. He's never going to mess up. He's never going to sin. He's never going to change his mind. He's never going to resign. He's always going to be God. And so when you anchor your joy and satisfaction in that, man, you're safe. You've anchored in something that's not going to move. So whatever you're more in awe of than you are of God, whatever, whatever uh, gushes your excitement level, or, oh, wasn't that amazing, or makes you deeply disappointed, whatever you've anchored in, that's what will happen. You'll get joy and disappointment that will go up and down from whatever you've anchored to, whatever you're looking for to get your sense of meaning and purpose and awe in life. But if you anchor it into God, then your awe will be centered in him so what i want to encourage you to do is just in your devotion in your prayer time in this in this time of prayer take out a, a note and make a list of the greatest competitors to god in your life what are the things now if you're if you're being honest if you're not going to be honest it doesn't matter but if you're being honest what are the things that you that you are excited about? What are the things that you're passionate about? What are the things that capture your imagination and your dreams and your desires and your longings and your wants? And what are the things that you're most disappointed over? And what are the things that, that uh, discourage you the most when they don't happen? Write a list of those things down. And you can just go ahead and call that competitors <laughs> to the place that only God belongs. You've become more in awe by something else other than him. And that creeps in to all of our lives. So let me give you an a very practical example. You may have heard me share this story before if you've been around Kingwood. Uh, years ago, I was at a, the first church I ever served at. And I was sitting next to the pastor's son in a service. And he looked over at me and he said, what size shoe you wear? And I told him about, about nine and a half. And he said, great. Uh, he goes, uh, you like these shoes? And I said, yeah, they're, yeah sure, they're great. And he goes, all right, I'm going to give them to you. And so after service, he gave me the shoes, and he walked home in socks. And I, and I said, why? why I, did, I, don't, I, want, <laughs> you know, I didn't want your shoes. Like, I'm not asking for shoes. And he said, here's the thing. These shoes have become so important to me, and I like them so much, I'm not going to let them rule my heart, so I'm going to give them away. So here's my recommendation to you. When you find something that is a competitor to God in your life, and it gets a little too big... Put it back in its place. Take a break. Take a time out. Take a season off. Take a, you know, whatever it is. If you find yourself getting more excited about fantasy football, then God, don't sign up next year. And invest the time you were going to put in that into reading the Bible or prayer or something that brings you closer to him. That's just an example. Whatever the things are, replace the replacements. Fill that gap. Number three, remind yourself who God is and what he's done. You know what's amazing? At the end of this celebration that King Solomon had, he prays a, a, a blessing over the people. Before they went home, before kind of the final act, he prays a blessing over the people. And in this blessing, we see a reminder of who God is. Listen to 1 Kings 8, 56. Praise be to the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel just as he promised. Not one word has failed of all the good promises he gave through his servant Moses. So what you have to do is you have to remind yourself of who God is and what he's done. That he's bigger than anything that you can pursue. That he's greater than anything you can pursue. And here's the thing. God's got a great track record. 
So all through the Bible, you can see all these promises that he gave to people, and you can read forward in the Bible and see how he kept all of those promises. And he never failed in one generation. He never failed in one promise. And you can see that, and you can also draw off the stories in your own life or in somebody else's life that you know where God has made it a profound difference or he intervened or he did a miracle. And you can say, look, that's what God did. Remind yourself who God is and what he's done. Here, I'll tell you how I do it in my life. Oftentimes when I'm praying, uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm distracted or whatever, I'll recenter myself in who God is. And, and it sounds something like this. When I'm walking and praying, I'll just say, God, you know, my mind's spinning about all these things that I need to be, you know, I want to do or whatever, or I'm excited about. And I say, you know what, though? There's no experience. There's no adventure. There's no um, thought. There's no accomplishment. There's no program. There's no resource in the whole world that compares to you. So why is it while I'm walking here praying and talking to you that those things keep spinning in and out of my mind? When I know that not one of them, King Solomon said, who compares to you? Nobody compares to you. So when I pray and I walk, I say, God, none of these things compare to you. I just call it out. None of this doesn't compare to you, and this doesn't compare to you. And there's a special challenge that I have that most of you might not, might not uh, experience in your own life. Here's the thing. What do you do when you're a pastor? And you go to spend your prayer time with God, and all your mind can think about is the church. All your mind can think about, oh, what are we going to do about this? And how are we going to reorganize that? And what decision are we going to make here? And wonder what this next sermon is going to be about, or this next series, or what, what about this season? All these thoughts about the church. And you can say, well, I mean, man, that's God's work. That's important. Maybe I should think about that. You know what I've learned to do in my prayer time? I say, you know what, God? The church is a terrible substitute for you. There is no one like you. Not the temple, not the New Testament temple, not the church, not the work of ministry, not anything else. He's in a category by himself. So what I say when I pray is, why would I spend my prayer time thinking about the church when I have this God who's unlike anybody else? I'm going to spend my time centered in you. That's the all of God. And I'm telling you, when you connect with God on that level, ah, it causes you to sort of look up. Your, your, your attention goes up and you say, man, there's really no comparison. Number four, return to the places where you meet God. Okay. One of the reasons that the awe of God disappears from our lives is because we, we fill our lives with activities and experiences and things that don't stoke his awe in our life. They sort of numb us out, and you know we work on all these other things so much, our brain's so overwhelmed with all the things of the earth, and many of them we have to do and we should do, and they're the right thing to do. But they, but they drain off our sense of awe and wonder about God. So how, what do you do? You have to go back to those places that stoke your awe. And as I have reflected on the New Testament, I, I think there's about six of them that I, I just want to bullet them for you real quick. That if you will return to these places or these activities, as you do, your awe for God will begin to be stoked. The first one we talked about last week, the Word of God. Reading the Word of God, the Word of God is the greatest revelation of God we have. And as you read it, you meet Him again and again in those pages and in those events, and it stokes your, your awe. You say, oh man, I, I never thought about it like that. Another one is uh, praying to God. You know, uh, the activity of prayer... Um, it, it lifts your focus because who are you talking to? I mean, you're sitting in a room by yourself talking out loud. Somebody walks in, they go, who are you talking to? You on the phone? No, who are you talking to? Oh, I'm talking to God. Oh, so God's here now. Yes, because he's always here. And you know what prayer does? It reminds me he's always here. 
and it stokes my awe of God. Uh, uh, another one is the people of God. Do you know in the New Testament, the people of God had this profound commitment to the community of God? This profound commitment. And as they would meet together, as they would fellowship, as they would pray, as they would, as they would do all the things that God's people did together, it created this sense of awe in the community. Why don't you just let this year be the year that you say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a commitment to be with the people of God because it's among those people that my all for God gets stoked. It doesn't, like my all for God doesn't get stoked down at the uh, at Buffalo Wild Wings. Nobody down there stoking my all. Right? I mean, at the water cooler at work or, you know, in the, in the chat room, whatever. Wherever the places you are, uh, on, the, on the ball field or in the athletic group or whatever. Whatever it is you do at the shopping group. Like, they're not stoking my for God. You know why? Because there's something special about God's people. God's people are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And His Spirit lives there. So why don't you let this year be the year that you just say, you know what? I, I, I get it. Life happens, and you can't engage in church every week, and I understand that. But you know what? You can do it most weeks. And you can say, I'm just, my pattern of my life is going to be, I'm going to gather with the people of God when they gather. I'm going to gather online. I'm going to gather in the room. And if you want to take it a step further, man, be a part of a life group. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you had a spiritual conversation with somebody? What I mean is, when's the last time you, you or somebody said to you, hey, what's God doing in your life right now? What's God teaching you? When's the last time you talked to somebody about something more than the weather or Nick Saban retired or whatever? Right? When's the last time you had a conversation that was spiritual? Can I tell you, those conversations will stoke your awe of God. Uh, t- two more. One is, uh, or three more, giving. If you look in the New Testament, there was this um, giving to God created this sense of awe. You know why? Because it released the supernatural provision of God among God's people. And there's this thing in the New Testament where they're like, one's always taking an offering over to another one, or they're running an offering over to Paul in prison or something. But there's this incredible dynamic that happens in the New Testament that they would say, you know what, when we give, and even sometimes sacrificially, we see God's provision come through in an amazing way, and it created all. The supernatural provision of God, that God would, God would intervene in ways that could be counted and measured on earth. And man, it just created a sense of awe for people. And then, and then worship. God's presence. There's this sense as the people of God would worship together that his presence was there and it was real and miracles would happen and people would get saved and people would find faith and, and uh, uh, bondages would be released from people and, and people would be set free from things that they were addicted to and, and amazing things. Miracles would happen. And then the last one is working for God. There's this um, mysterious partnership. I don't totally understand it. But God does most of his work on earth through people. Not all of it, but most of it. He does it through people. And here's the crazy part. He does it through ordinary people and common people. And, And not like, you know, look, most of the work that's been done on earth most of the work of God has not been done through big, talented, mega, star, important people. It's been done through common, ordinary, everyday people for all of history. And there's something amazing when we join that partnership with God and we work for Him and we minister for Him. There's something amazing that happens. These gifts, these spiritual gifts that He's put in us start to flow And sometimes even manifestation gifts crop up by the Holy Spirit. And things are done and people's lives are touched. And people are encouraged and set free and built up and lifted up. And it's an an amazing miracle. And when you see it, it creates awe in your life. Because you say, wow, wow, look what God did. And then you look inside and you go, I I, I know that wasn't me. (laughs) Because I had nothing. I had nothing. But somehow when I started talking, somehow when I reached out, somehow when I sent the text, somehow when I made the phone call, something started to change. I don't even know what it was. But man, did you see what happened in their life? And you know what that creates? Awe. Like, wow. We're not alone. 
Man, God is involved. God is on the scene. Let this be the year that you get involved and you become part of the movement of hope. Let this be the year that you share your faith with somebody. Let this be the year that you reach out and care for someone who doesn't even have a church home. Become a hope giver to somebody else. Now, last thing I'm going to say today, and this is the most important. I gave you six things that I saw in the New Testament that when people return to them, their awe of God got stoked. But here's, if, you're, if you're doing math, here's probably what you're thinking. Or maybe you're thinking this. Yeah, but that's not most of life. Like, I'm not praying most of the time. I'm not reading my Bible most of the time. I'm not, you know, all these things aren't happening most of the time. Most of the time, I'm, you know, figuring out how to get groceries and put another meal on the table and get the kids to, you know, practice and get home, all the things. That's what I'm doing most of the time. Well, that's the ordinary time, the common time, the in-between time. Can we just agree that most of life is the in-between time? That's what it is. Most of life, miracles aren't happening. Most of life, these things aren't just breaking out over here. But watch this. Watch. Here's the most important thing I'm going to say to you today. If you will return to the places that you experience the awe of God, you will begin to experience the awe of God in the places you never did before. Because you will stoke that awe and transcendence of God in your life and it will begin to invade the ordinary and the normal and the everyday part of your life. But you're not going to get buried deep enough in the ordinary part of life to have the awe of God. But it will feed it if you'll center there. Would you stand with me this morning? What a beautiful time 21 days of prayer and fasting. And God has brought us together today to remind us that there's no one like him. Would you just say that with me? God, there's no one like you. Just say that with me. God, there's no one like you. Come on, one more time. God, there's no one like you. I lift my eyes up today. (laughs) I lift my heart up today. Nothing deserves my affection and my attention like you do. And I lift up my gaze and I set it on you. And with King Solomon, I stretch my arms out and I say, God, there's no one like you. Lord, we worship you today. Our worship team's coming to lead us in this song. And as they do, I want you just to lift your heart up and say, Lord, there's no one like you. God, stir us today. Stir our hearts today. Stir our imaginations. Stir our faith. Stir up a hunger inside of us, Lord. And change us this morning. God, we want to live in the awe of God. In Jesus' name, let's sing this together.